Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Ooh. It's loud. For some reason, I came over here and I wanted to say good morning. That's the, that's the mindset I'm in today. Can you feel that? Anybody else feel that way? Still tired? Still ready for a nap? Yeah. It's been, it's been that kind of day. <laughs> um, if you go ahead and stand with us tonight, we don't have any announcements. Um, we'll go ahead and just jump right in and praise the Lord for what He's always done for us, right? Yeah. Uh, if you have a need, let's just go ahead and lift it up to the Lord. Let's just give it over to him. Let's trust him with it tonight and just say, Jesus, this is yours. We give it to you. God, we thank you for everything that you do for us. Holy Spirit, we just want to first welcome you here tonight. Come and just have your way tonight, Holy Spirit. Let your will be done. Minister to us, Lord, through this music, through the worshiping of you, God, and minister to us through uh, the teaching of this word tonight, Father. God, once again, we just come before you. We lay our needs at your feet. And God, we just say we trust you with them. We give them over to you. And Jesus, we pray for your divine interaction to come about and, and meet these needs tonight that we have, Lord. God, we give you all the praise and all the glory. We thank you for this. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's, let's worship the Lord tonight. Amen. We were fed this morning by the word, and we look forward to what Brother Rick has to give us tonight. Let's open up this evening's service, church, as we sing this worship song, The Healer. He was 
kind of stuck with me and it's still with me when pastor was talking about in his sermon I believe a week ago singing a new song it could still be the same song but singing it each day and just lifting up your voice to God to me makes it a new song amen in this song is it gets sweeter as the days go by church before you have a seat. Hey Amen. For some reason, I get into my mind Jackie Gleason saying how sweet it is, but I don't know if that's appropriate or not, but it is sweeter, <laughs> sweeter as the days go by. <laughs> All right. This is, uh, hopefully tonight will be the last time we're uh, in the book of Job, uh, for a little while anyway. 
and uh, we'll try and finish it up tonight. All right, appreciate Brother Cody uh, filling in for me last Sunday night. Uh, we, uh, my wife and I, kind of got uh, stuck into uh, flipping a rental, uh, so uh, it's still not done. So, so uh, you pray for us. We're 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 working hard and uh, trying to flip it so we can put it on the market and and uh, and uh, it is not easy. It is not easy. Yeah, I'm Chip and she's Joanna. She she's the pretty one and I'm the silly one. <laughs> yeah, guess you knew that already though, right? But we appreciate the Lord. We appreciate Brother Cody again. And uh, I got to tune into his message uh, later on in the week and enjoyed it when life stinks. Amen. And it does from time to time, doesn't it? Amen. And uh, boy, Job knew all about it. Life stunk for him really, really bad. Amen. And uh, we have been reading about him and about his the account of his suffering, because that is what the book of Job is. It is the account of his suffering. It's not a story. Amen. If Job was a fictitious character, we would start the book once upon a time. Amen. But he is not a fictitious character. He is a real person. Amen. And this really happened to a very real person. Amen. And uh, we've been trying our best to uh, wade our way through um, Getting through the tough spots, because everybody's going to have a tough spot uh, in their life from time to time. I can't tell you. I wish I could tell you uh, why. I wish I could tell you all the details of what uh, you can do to avoid it. I wish I could tell you all the details of what you can do once you're in it to shorten the term. I wish I could tell you uh, what you can do uh, once you're in it uh, to completely get out of it. Amen? But I want to be honest with you tonight and say that sometimes you won't. It's discouraging, isn't it? To know that there may be a calamity or an adversity that happens to some of us that we'll carry with us. Amen? Uh, not everybody has the same degree of adversity as other people. It seems like other people have a good, easy life, while other people seem to struggle all the way through. Amen? And uh, I, I, think, I think we can all look around us and be honest with ourselves and know that that's true. Okay, neither is the degree of suffering or adversity the same with everybody. Okay, no matter how long the term is, some people go through some really, really awful stuff. Amen. And the only way to know that is if somebody tells you their story. Amen. But we don't want to tell people our story anymore. We want to keep things to ourselves and keep things close to our chest and, and not tell us, tell everybody about the bad parts of our life. Amen? But in order for us to have healing and for other people uh, to learn from us, we have to be able to tell our story. Amen? And to be able to tell your story with honesty and without embellishment Amen. It's very, very, very important. Amen. Because it brings healing to you, first of all, and then brings deliverance to other people. Amen. To know that somebody else has gone through what you're going through and made it through, through to the other side, amen, is encouraging. Amen. To know that some people have gone through worse things than you are and still alive to tell the story, amen, it's, it's, it's encouraging. Amen. And it helps people. But it only helps people if we'll tell it. Amen. And it only helps people if we'll be honest. Amen. And it only helps people if we uh, are not afraid to embarrass ourselves. Amen. And to, and, and to, and to be honest enough to, to tell everybody that we're not perfect. Amen. 
So it's important. Okay, so it was the account of Job's suffering. Everybody say suffering with me. Because everybody loves to suffer. There's a long sign at the suffering booth. Amen. Everybody loves to suffer. Amen. But to, to tell you the truth, the Bible says, if you're going to reign with me, Jesus said, he said, you will also suffer with me. Amen. Suffering goes along with reigning. Amen. And I, I'm not sure that I, I, I want to be God's hero. I've said all along throughout this, this series, I don't know if I want to be God's hero. I don't want my name mentioned in heaven after I see Job's story. Amen. But, uh, but, but, I, but I want to be able to do what God wants me to do and be in the position that God wants me to be in and, and to occupy the space that God wants me to occupy. Don't you? I want to be able to be like Paul and say, and when I get there, when I get to the other side, say that I fought a good fight and I kept the faith and I ran my course. Amen. I didn't run somebody else's course. I didn't try to be anybody else. I tried to be what you wanted me to be. And, and, and I, I didn't uh, do a perfect job, but I did my best. That's what I want to be able to say. Amen. When I get there. Okay. So, pain and suffering... Uh, have I, as, as I have experienced it, I'll call it normal life. I haven't had things really, really bad and awful and terrible. I don't have that in my story to tell you. I've had some bad stuff happen, yeah. Amen. I, I, I've got some things in my story that you would say, oh, or oh. Or, mm, I feel so bad for you, and all that other kind of stuff. You would say that to me, but to me, I would just tell you, it's just normal life. Because it happens to everybody, and my brand of suffering and my brand of adversity is no different than anybody else's. The term may be longer, the term may be shorter, the, the, the uh, uh, amount of adversity that I face at the time and the awfulness and the terrible, uh, terribleness of it might be different than yours, and yours may be different than mine, but I think I can honestly and safely say that it's just normal life. We're all going to fit. If you need some Bible for that, the Bible says that in this life, you will have tribulation. You will have it. Look at your neighbor and say, it's normal. It's normal to face adversity. It's normal to face struggle. It's normal to face suffering. It's normal. It's not at all fun, but it is normal. Amen. So when we come to that place where it's our turn, amen, and we begin to face the stuff that other people have faced, it's important for us to have a theology or a belief in God that will carry us through it or carry us through to the logical end of it. And that may be all the way to the other side. Amen. Now, when somebody, when the doctor says, you know, there's nothing more than we can do, then, then you've got something that nobody else is going to be able to help you with. And if God doesn't or chooses not to help you with it, then you're going to carry it through to the other side. Amen? Look at your neighbor and say, that's normal. That's just normal. Because How do you know it's normal, brother? Because it happens every day, everywhere. Amen? And when it happens to us, though, <laughs> it's different. Why is it different? Because it's us. And we're God's friend. And He loves me. And He doesn't want to see me go through that. Now we're in Job's shoes. Amen? Because Job was perfect and upright and he eschewed evil. Amen? And he was a good man. And bad things 
happen to good people. There's a, there's a term for that. I just found out the other day, the other day uh, when I was doing, doing a little bit of reading. And, and it's theodicy or theodicy, whichever one you want to talk about or, or whichever way you want to pronounce it. Okay? But it's, it, it's a fancy word for the simple question, why do bad things happen to good people? Okay? Or it's a theological, theological belief of why you believe bad things happen to good people. Okay? I hope that by now, through all these five weeks now <laughs> that we've talked about it, we do realize that bad things do happen to good people. Amen? And it's what? And it's normal! Normal! It's normal unless it happens to you, and then it's a tragedy. Are you with me? Because when it's us, it's personal, it's painful to us. Not painful to somebody else, it's painful to us. Now we're putting ourselves in the shoes of his three friends. Because it was painful to Job, it wasn't painful to them. All right. So we're going to talk just a little bit, and then we're going to we'll get to our takeaways from the book, and then we'll uh, close it up, and 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 you'll say thank God. <laughs> All right. Now, I want to tell you this. Okay. Uh, let's let central to the book, and central to the questions, and and central to all of it is what happened in heaven. Everybody say what happened in heaven. Okay. Because you didn't see it. Job didn't see it. The three friends didn't see it. Elihu didn't see it. Nobody heard it. Nobody saw it. All they did was feel the effect of it. Amen? Nobody saw it. All right? And it went like this. Job chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. And verse 8 says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? And there is none like him in the earth. He is perfect, an upright man, feareth God, and he eschews evil. And Satan answered the Lord and did said, Doth Job? fear you for not. Hast thou made an hedge about him and, and about his house and all that he hath on every side? Uh, thou hast blessed the work of his hands and, and his substance is increased in the, ha- in his, in the land, uh, but, for, but, but for thine hand now touch not all that he hath and, and he will curse you uh, to your face. Now this is a conversation between the accuser of the brethren and God. Amen. In a time when they presented themselves before God. And we notice in the reading that God brings up Job. And that's why I don't want to be on the, I want to fly below the radar. I don't want to be the hero. Don't bring up my name. I want to be a good guy, but not so good that my name gets mentioned. But stop and think just for a minute. Why did God mention Job? Because God trusted Trusted in what? Are you forgetting who he's talking to? Before we called him Satan, we called him Lucifer. The archangel created of God who covered and guarded the earth. But pride was found in him You remember the story. Pride was found in him. And when he fell, one third of heaven fell with him. And then when God began to recreate the earth and on the 
last day, or the or the sixth day he created a man in his likeness and in his image lucifer is now standing in front of god and god asks him what are you doing and he says i'm going to and fro the earth up and down in it which goes along with what Peter said. He goes to and fro throughout the earth. What's he doing? What's he doing? He's seeking whom he may devour. And although that's not mentioned in Job, that is certainly known by God. And so God mentions Job because God trusts Job. Have you considered this one while you're out there doing what you're doing? And listen what the accuser said. The accuser not only accused Job, no, he didn't accuse Job at all. He accused God. He said, said, you have him spoiled. You have him so protected and so blessed that I can't touch him. But I'll tell you what you can do, God. If you'll take away his protection and you'll stop blessing him, then he'll curse you to your face. So is not Job over here as a trusted person of God, while Lucifer, the archangel, fallen from God, accuses God himself concerning Job. This has just gotten some more high stakes, hasn't it? Because this conversation that's going on in heaven was not seen or heard by any of the other characters or persons in this story, or this account. Not a story. Nobody else heard this except them. They only felt the effects. So everything becomes a little more intense knowing who we're talking about. We're talking about God, and we're talking about the one. Everybody say one. The one person of his creation that caused one-third of what he created to fall. And if he had his way, would cause the rest of God's creation to fall as well. Why? Because he likes you and wants you on his ball team? He wants you in in his vast repertoire of people? Because you're talented and you're good looking and you're. and all that? (laughs) Or does he just hate God so much? Is it his ambition to oppose everything that God does? I can answer that with two names Adam and Eve, the first ones. And who shows up on the scene? Who shows up on the scene? Lucifer. Satan. To oppose what God is doing. I've lost track of my notes. Is that okay? (laughs) 
But I want to take you to jap uh, chapter 42 to end the book, because that's a good place to end it since it's the last chapter. <laughs> you thought I was dumb, didn't you? <laughs> Job, chapter 42. This is the submission of Job and the restoration of Job. We all know the end of the story, right? We've read this before, learned it in Sunday school. That God did deliver Job. God did bless Job. Twice as much as he ever had. Okay? Except kids. And all the parents say, Hallelujah. Maybe that was a blessing of God. I don't know. <laughs> the last time we heard, God was speaking to Job out of a whirlwind. Amen? And God hit him with a barrage of questions concerning who is God and who isn't. He asked him, where were you when I did this? What would you do here? What would you do there? Who's God and who isn't? Who can do such things? I talked to you about the sun and the moon and the, and the planetary alignment and all this. And my wife and I were talking about that the other day. And, and, and we just marveled at the people who believe that we came from a single cell and evolved into what you see sitting in front of you. Amen? Somehow it all just crawled out of a swamp somewhere. We're swamp people. There you go. <laughs> Some single cell amoeba, and we somehow evolved into a complicated human being on a planetary system that is so complicated that if anything was changed, we couldn't survive it. But it just happened. Just happened. What did you say? Big Bang. Yeah. Guess who lit the fuse? Are you, are you with me? Don't you just marvel? I remember Mark Lowry talking about it. He said, I'd be an atheist too if I had that much faith. Does it take more faith to believe that you came from a single cell that crawled out of a swamp or from a God who divinely and wonderfully made you? Fearfully and wonderfully made you. What takes more faith? Well, let's just go on. That was a commercial. Not even in the notes. Okay? Chapter 42. Let's go back there. God had talked to Job out of the whirlwind, and they had discussed it, and, and, and Job couldn't answer the questions because Job wasn't God and God is. Job chapter 42, verses 1 through 6, Job is now going to submit himself to God. Isn't that a good thing to do? The Bible says, submit yourself therefore to God. Amen? It's a good thing to do, right? Submit yourself to God. The one that we call Lord, we should also submit to. See how it works? All right, well, let's go on. Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do anything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I know not. Here I beseech thee, I will, sp I will speak, I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Okay? I want to take that last sentence there where he repents in dust and ashes. Okay? And I want to point out for, for us all just one simple thing. 
Okay, what is it that he was repenting of? Because the Bible says, according to the book of Job itself, when the Lord spoke of Job, he was speaking to Lucifer again, the second time now, and he says, you tried to get me to destroy him without cause. Everybody look at your neighbor and said this was not Job's fault. The three friends thought it was, but it was not Job's fault. He didn't do anything, as far as we know, to bring this on himself. Have you ever said that to somebody? Well, you brought this on yourself. Anybody ever told you that? Well, you brought this on yourself. This wasn't the case. Without cause, okay? He said, I repent in dust and ashes. So, up to the time of his calamity, he had nothing to repent of that we know of. But somehow, during his calamity, now there is something that he needs to repent of. Are you with me? Something happened in the calamity. Something happened in the adversity. Something happened during that time frame. Now, we know that the Bible says that he never cursed God with his lips. But he did curse the day he was born, and he cursed life itself. And he said that God was against him. Amen? There were some other things all in there, uh, kind of... Uh, added in there that we could go back and get all those details, but we'd be right here for about another year. And everybody look at Rick and say, you don't want that. Yeah, we don't want to be in the book of Job for a year, and we certainly don't want Rick in the book of Job for a year. Okay? But the details are all in there. We skipped a lot of those things. But just to tell you, amen, just some simple stuff. How many believes the Bible is simple? That's what I thought. then how can simple people like me be saved? Man has done more to confuse other people about God than the Bible ever did. The Word of God is for us to know Him. And if it's so complicated that we can't understand it, how in the world will we ever know God? The Word of God is built on simple principles. Simple, understandable principles. Amen? And one of the ones in the book of Job is is, is very simple. When Job went through his calamity, everybody said he went through it. Okay? Look at your neighbor and said, God took me through some things. He took me around some things. Some things I never had to go through, but some things I had to go all the way through them. And God took me through them. Amen? It's the tough spot that I was telling you about. The tough spots. He takes you through those tough spots. Okay? Now, as, as, as Job was in there, though, his, his theology changed. His belief about God changed. Why? Because in the middle of suffering, in the middle of tests, in the middle of trial, and when life stinks, oftentimes so does our theology. Why? Because it's been challenged. When your theology gets challenged and when your faith gets challenged, that's when you know what faith really is. You don't know you have faith until you've been taken to the end of it. You don't know how much faith you have until you run out. Amen? And it's good to know if your faith works or not. It's one, thing to, it's one thing to say, hey, I can fly an airplane. I saw it on YouTube. Huh? All right, let me make it simpler. <laughs> simpler, okay? <laughs> More simple. I watched on YouTube how to fix a car. And later on, 
one when I had it towed in to have some. <laughs> huh? It's good to know that your faith works. How do you know your faith works? You have to be challenged. It has to be tested. And you have to be taken to the end of it. And there's only one person who knows where the end of your faith is. It's the one who sent the test. Because if you have this much faith and He takes you to the end of it, the next time you come back to these tests, you got more. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And the experiences of life are going to teach you some things that cause you to believe about God in a way that you did not formally believe about God. Your theology changes in and out of adversity. But Job, though he did not curse God to his face, just like Satan said he would, though he did not do that, he had some stuff that he needed to repent of. Amen? You ever been through something that just weighs on you and tests you to the point where you're just not yourself? And your faith is running out? Amen? <laughs> I'm going to go somewhere. Can I go somewhere? And it changes the way you talk. And it changes the way you act. And it changes the way you treat people. It changed you. Because why? Because in the middle of the test, in the crucible and the fire of tests, is when you're really being tested and you're really being challenged. Amen? And it will flat affect your faith. Amen? It did Job. So he had something to, to repent of. And he, and he did. He, he, he said this. He said, he, <coughs> he said, I know that you can do anything. He said, I know that you, none of my thoughts are withholding from you. And he said, I, I, I said some things that I shouldn't have said. You ever done that? Said some things you shouldn't have said. Said some things to God you shouldn't have said. No, brother, not me. Oh, no, not me. Well, I'll raise my hand, and I'll raise my other hand, because in the middle of testing, and your faith is running out, amen, and you feel like God is against you, your prayer changes too, doesn't it? Oh, thank you, God, for your blessings on me, and thank you for watching over me and protecting me, and all these other... But when you think that God is not protecting you and not on your side, your prayer changes. There's a lot more whys in there. And a lot more eyes, and a lot more me's, and a lot more you's with your finger pointed towards heaven. I know that doesn't happen in your life, but... So Job repents because of what happened in his attitudes in the calamity. Okay? Now, <coughs> let me read you a couple notes uh, that I found while I was studying. Okay? It was right for Job to repent. He had done nothing to invite the crisis that came into his life. The, re the reason it sounds so good is because I didn't write it. All right? uh, the reasons for that crisis were rooted in the contention between God and Satan, as recorded in Job chapters 1 and 2. Yet he did not have to repent of his wrong words. He did have to repent, sorry. He did have to repent of his wrong words, wrong attitude in the midst of his crisis. But for, uh, but for excessively giving uh, into despair and for unwise intemperate speech, even when contending with his companions. And this was written by Charles Spurgeon. Okay. Uh, Job repented of the terrible curse. Uh, he had pronounced from the day, on the day of his birth. Job repented uh, of his desire to die. Job repented of his complaints and, uh, as he challenged God. Job repented uh, of his despair. And Job repented of his statements being darkened by wisdom of words without knowledge. He that spoke beyond his knowledge and, and, and ability to know. And, and you ever said... <laughs> 
You ever had? You ever said something that you you had no idea what you were talking about? Nobody wants to admit it. You had no idea what you were talking about. Well, when you didn't see what was going on in heaven, and you didn't hear what was going on in heaven, how could you testify and determine and have an opinion on what was going on in heaven? Job was speaking about things he didn't know. Well, let's go on. Job 42, verses 7 through 9. And it was so, after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said unto Eliphaz, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for ye have not spoken the thing that is right, as Job has. Now wait a minute now. Rick, you're confusing me because Job had said some stuff he shouldn't have said, spoke out of turn, spoke about things he didn't know about, but yet God is saying now, you guys, you three friends, spoke the wrong thing and Job spoke the right thing. When did Job spoke the right thing? Is that right? Is that good English? When did, when did Job spoke the right thing? In verses 1 through 6, where he submitted himself to God and repented of his wrong attitude. Okay? Well, let's go on because i got to get to my takeaways. All right? So starting with verse 8 there, chapter 42, verse 8. Take therefore unto thee seven bullocks and seven rams, and go unto thy servant Job, and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering, and my servant Job shall pray for you, for him, uh, for him will I accept. Hmm. That's tough. Here's your three friends trying to do their best to console and, confront and comfort Job. And Job come right out and tell them. Ten times they spoke to this guy. And all ten times, Job, and finally Job had enough of it. And he said, you guys are some sorry comforters. You guys, you guys are no good at this. Go back to what you used to do because you're no good at this. You have not spoken the right thing like my servant Job. So Eliphaz and, Tim, and, and the Temanite, they need to rena rename their towns too, don't they? Bildad, Zophar, they did according to the Lord's command. The Lord also accepted Job. So they go, their command is to take a burnt offering and let Job pray for them. One who just called me a sorry comforter isn't going to lay hands on me? I don't think so. They didn't say the right thing about God, but Job did. And now... God gives them a command. Why? Because Job is some superhuman guy and he's a great guy and, and God wants him to pray for you so that you'll be accepted? Or did it have more to do with following what God said? A challenge for them as well. A challenge to their humility. A challenge to their pride. A challenge to their thoughts and ideas about themselves. Amen. Take an offering and go offer it with Job, and he'll pray for you. Amen? I don't want to start no trouble, but who's about the last person you want praying for you? Some old church lady over there. I don't want her praying for me. So what if God told you, go 
over there and ask her to pray for you. Would you do it? Or would pride get in your way? You see what I'm saying? It's not about Job, and it's not about the three friends. It's about God and obeying what He says. All right? Let's go on. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job. This is found starting in verse 12. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 she-donkeys. And he had also seven sons and three daughters. Now when you find out Go back to the first chapter of the book of Job. This is exactly two times what he had. Exactly two times. Well, Brother Ricky said he had seven sons. He's, he had seven sons and three daughters here, and he had seven sons and three daughters there. You don't lose your sons and daughters when you know where they went. He still had 20 kids. Lord help him. <laughs> and in all the land were no women found as fair as the daughters of Job. And their father gave them an inheritance among their brethren. And this lived Job 140 years. He saw his sons and his sons and his sons four generations. Job died being old and full of days. So God restored Job twice what he had. We all knew that before I ever said anything about it. We all knew God was going to do that before I ever started because we've already heard the story. We've already heard the account. Okay? But he blessed him. Everybody say God blessed him. What did he bless? He blessed his obedience. See, we're not, we're not comfortable with obedience because we don't want people telling us what to do. We don't want people to tell us what to do and lord things over on us and, and have that kind of power over us. We want to be independent, God-fearing people. Well, obedience and rebellion are key concepts to the Lordship of Christ. Because if we have Christ as our Lord, then we obey Him. And that goes against our Western culture. That goes against our independent nature. No? Nobody else? Just me? Obedience to Christ and His Word is a key concept because on the other side of obedience is rebellion. There is no middle ground. You want some Bible for that? Even he that knows to do good and doesn't do it to him it's a sin. And there is no graduated scale of sin. There's not little sins and big sins. There is sin, and sin separates us from God. How important is obedience? Absolutely vital. And that's the story, and that's the account of Job and his three friends. Never mentions Elihu for some reason. Maybe he said what was right. But the three friends were also challenged. Takeaways. Let's get some takeaways in in ten minutes. Okay? All right? This is what I take away from the book of Job. Okay? Do you want to learn something from the book of Job? Other than the history and, the, and, and what happened. Okay? What happened with Job, was, we can say it was normal because bad things happen to good people, but what, 
happened to Job on the severity scale, I've never been there. Hope I never have to go there. And I've never known anybody to go through what Job went through. Nobody. I've, I've seen some people go through some awful stuff. Not like this guy. Not like this guy. So what do you take away? Number one, I want to talk about that conference in heaven just for a second. Okay? When we see the accuser of the brethren and we talked about who it was, who the, who the conversation was between, and that Job is just the one whom God trusted to go through the test to prove to Lucifer that there are people on this planet, including Job, that would go through the test and not curse God. Okay? And that's important. Everybody say that's important. Let me ask you a personal question, and you don't have to answer this or not, but if what happened to Job happened to you, how would you react? You don't know, do you? No, because it's in the crucible of conflict. We would, right now, what we'd do, you know what we'd say? We'd start talking faith. We'd start talking about how much faith we have. You know why? Because we don't know how much we have. But when you reach the end of it and you have to trust God for the rest, now things are totally different. Conversations change, your, your, your confession change, all that stuff changes. Amen? When you, when you get to that end. Okay? So, now, <clears throat> and we see God that was confident of Job to be trusted. Okay? And we was also confident that Job could be tested. Okay, and here, here, here's something I take away from the book of Job. Okay, we have to be tested. You have to be tested. I have to be tested. You have to be tested. Brother Chris has to be tested. He's the pastor. He don't have to be tested no more. Yeah, he wish, yeah. You always have to be tested. Okay, why? Don't forget who was talking in heaven. Satan and God. Amen? The one who messed it all up and the one who created all of it. Let me take you one step farther. Over in the Garden of Eden, Satan is the one who messed it up. He messed it up. Do you realize that if Satan had not messed up the Garden of Eden, your life and my life would be totally different? Rose bushes wouldn't have thorns. That's just one. I got a million of them and we don't have time. But I just cut down a rose bush in, in the front yard of that rental. Rose bushes have thorns. And when you're laying on the ground with the sawzall trying to cut down that thing and it falls on your face, you know rose bushes have thorns. You didn't see that, did you? See how much you mean see how much you mean to me? We all have to be tested. The Bible tells me that broad is the gate that leads to destruction, narrow is the gate that leads to righteousness, and very few there will be that enter in that gate. Are you with me? Why? We have to be tested here, not there. We have to be sanctified here, not there. You see, the there already happened. And one-third of heaven's angels fell. The testing comes here. The testing happens here. In light of there. You see, when we pass away, when we leave this earth, we go to where he is. Right? We go through that gate, and that's where he is. As a matter of fact, he is the gate. He is the door. So we go through him 
and we get to where he said, eye has not seen and ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what he has prepared for us over there. So we go through there. That's not the place where you get tested and make your mistakes. This is. This is it. This is not where your faith is examined up there. It's examined here. Why? We don't want another Lucifer up there. We don't want another pride-filled angel up there. So during testing down here, we're going to find out what those problems are. Amen. And how theology changes. <laughs> so that we can deal with it here. And not there. Amen. Well, that's one. All right. In the ten, ten interactions with Job, which is most of the book of Job, with his three friends, okay, there's some things we ought to learn about that. There are some things we need to learn. Okay. Because Sister Esther may go through a tough spot. Okay, and you love Sister Esther, don't you? Okay, so you're going to do what? You're going to try and help Sister Esther. You're going to try and comfort Sister Esther. Okay, there are some things we need to know about Job's three friends, about what they did and they didn't do, about what they said and shouldn't have said, before we ever go to Sister Esther. You know what the best thing that they, those three friends did? They sat there in silence. They sat there in silence and mourned with him. Amen? It's only when they started talking that they messed it all up. Amen? All right? So go back and read that great big middle section, and you'll find out what to do and what to do, uh, what not to do when, when somebody else is going through their tough time. Amen? Now, they won't tell you it's their tough time. You're going to have to figure that out on your own. Amen? Or God may have to help you. I don't know. All right? Then I want to talk just a second about the Odyssey. Okay, we got one more minute left. The Odyssey, bad things do happen to good people. You can't change that. You're not going to be able to change that. You're going to have to accept it, that bad things do happen to good people. That's, the, that's that big word, the Odyssey, uh, that intellectual word, the Odyssey. The Odyssey. Yeah, I can't even say it now. Uh, and, and I wanted to tell you... Uh, Job wanted to know why. And he never got the answer. I wanted to know why for Job. I never got the answer. I read the whole book. I didn't get the answer. I read a couple people's commentary. They didn't have the answer either. I read one guy's commentary and he had the answer, but as you read on a little farther, you find out he had the answer to just about everything. Maybe Elihu said it best in 37 and 5 where he said, God thundereth marvelously with, his voice, marvelously with his voice. Great things doth he which cannot be comprehended. Are you okay with not being able to understand God? Are you okay if he doesn't tell you why? For us in our proud Western culture, that's unacceptable. We want somebody to explain their actions, including God. And as a sovereign God, it's not that he doesn't love you and he doesn't care for you. We just don't understand what he's doing. We don't understand what he's doing. Job went through the fire. Guess what we found out about Job? Once it weighed out on Job, all this weight of what was going on in his life, his theology changed. There's only one way to find that out. You've got to go through it, okay? Now, uh, one more. Well, there's actually two more. Uh, when God speaks out to me out of the whirlwind, I want to be listening to what he says and not listening for my answer. When God speaks to me out of the whirlwind, I want to hear what he says. Not what I'm hoping he will say. 
I'm expecting the answer. Job was expecting the answer, and he didn't get it, and neither did we. Here's the one that's toughest. God will not fit in the box I want him to stay in. I need understanding. I need predictability. I need to know. And God will not stay in the box. That's very difficult for me. me. Because I want to know and to understand and to know what's coming. I want it to be predictable and God is not predictable. Elihu said it best. We can't comprehend him. And lastly, I want to just tell you this. As far as theology goes, I want to just ask you one simple question. Can God be trusted? Can God be trusted? You know why you say that? If I ask you this in the middle of your turmoil, in the middle of your calamity, Can God be trusted? When you and me are repenting the day that we were born and life itself, and we are saying to ourselves that God is against me, can God be trusted? Now you know that's where the end of your faith is when you start questioning whether God can be trusted. That's where it ends. And I don't know where that is for you. I don't know where it is for me. But that's where it ends. When we start asking ourselves, can I trust God with my life? I call Him Lord, but can I trust Him? It's tough, right? Right? It's only in that conflict and in that adversity you're going to find these things out. The only way Job found it out, the only way we're going to find it out. Not any fun at all, is it? Amen. Everybody ready to shout now and rejoice? And No. Why? Because you don't have your answer. You wanted me to tell you why bad things happen to good people, and all I can tell you is yes, they do. Do you trust God? When they happen to you, do you trust God? That's the whole thing. That's the whole thing. Bow your heads with us. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness and grace and mercy. We thank you, Lord, for the for these people that have come out night after night and still don't have the question answered. Still that foreboding feeling of, if my name comes up in heaven, what's going to happen to me? Do you trust God? God trusted Job. Father, help us to trust you. You know us better than we know us. You know where the end of our faith is, and the only way we're going to know is if you take us there. We are thankful for your goodness and grace and mercy towards us. We thank you for saving our souls. And we thank you, Lord, for the work that you have continued to do in our life from the day that you saved us until this very moment. You're still doing work in our lives. And Father, whatever comes in the days ahead, help us to know that we can trust you, that you're not against us, and that life is a precious gift every day, every moment, and every hour that you have blessed us to have. We're thankful for watching over us. We're thankful for your help and grace. For Lord, we believe 
your work in our life is to get us through that narrow gate. We don't know how to get there without you. We don't know what it takes to get there without you. You have to take us there. And you have to make sure that we're ready. And that's what you're doing in our lives right now. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness, grace, and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. Give the Lord a good hand of praise for his work in your life. Six, six I had. Did I have six? Yeah. Six takeaways. Huh? Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Whoop. This is it's a mountain to trust you and believe. Give me Jesus I thought I could control Whatever life would throw my way But this I will admit Has brought me to my knees I need you Lord And I'm not ashamed